I want to talk briefly about the assignment with some recommendations and of course if there are any questions I'll be glad to respond especially for any new students who added before the end of the ad drop period. After that I want to go through a brief presentation on this week's readings from this week on we'll have weekly readings from the early 1900s about the automobile this week we have three short stories about the automobile from a writer who was born in Brooklyn and they're all very interesting and they document the very first phase of the reaction of society to this new technology if there is time, after my presentation, I would like to go back briefly to The Love Fag, the 1968 movie we watched last week, because it was a pity that I took too long to talk about the future of the automobile. And by the way, you, you will find, as promised, a series of pictures from Electrify Expo, 2023 and I added captions to expand that and I made that an additional reading it's not very long it's just the captions to 10 or 15 photos but it was a pity we didn't get to see a crucial scene what happens after Jim Douglas realizes that Herbie in a fit of jealousy is destroying the Lamborghini 400 GT and therefore Jim Douglas himself has to acknowledge that there is something more than just nuts and bolts to the little machine and I want to show the next few minutes if there is time okay so as you see from the announcement I went through your uh, assignments I did it the first time on Saturday morning, right after the deadline for this first assignment, which was Friday night. And then I checked again for any late submissions or people who received, were granted an extension last night. So as of last night, all of the assignments that were posted have been reviewed, graded, and you'll find comments. So. Go check those comments. On my side, I've set up the system in such a way that whenever you post a comment or respond to one of my comments, I receive a notification. So I see it right away. I can open the file or I can respond from inside uh, the uh, message, the notification itself, and it'll be uh, transformed into a comment. Okay, when you read my comments, of course, if you want clarifications or you want to respond, uh, just use the comments feature. Otherwise, you can resolve, you can close those comments with one exception. Leave there the comment where the grade is posted. Now, mind you, I have copies of the grade in my spreadsheet and the comments I left but it's more practical for me to review your progress to see how you're doing if those comments are left there so delete all comments but the comment attached to the title where uh, the grade is and if you did delete it I reopened it myself okay as simple as that if you did not complete the assignment either because you couldn't understand the instructions, couldn't find the file, don't understand how it works, you can still submit the first assignment, but let me know what assistance you need from me to enable you to do that. To review the basics, every student in this class has a shared Google Docs file which was created by me and shared with you. Therefore, it's accessible to you individually and to me as well, with full editing rights. That's where you post every assignment, the most recent on top, okay, blog style. 
and you post there the text of the assignment, right? Don't post a link to your assignment. Don't send me the assignment on my inbox. Don't send me a notification that you've completed the assignment. I'll see it myself. And again, as long as the day, the, the, the next morning after a deadline, I find your assignment, I'm not going to check whether you met the midnight deadline or completed it at 1.05 a.m. Doesn't matter to me, okay? And, of course, if you, for whatever reason, cannot complete the assignment, a short extension is not a big issue for me either. But be professional, ask for an extension, provide an explanation, even a simple explanation, right? You don't have to uh, pretend that some catastrophe happened you may just say, I'm going through a lot and I need a little more time to complete this assignment. That, that, that's fine, okay? And preferably, if you ask for an extension, specify how much time you need, okay? Um, what else? I think that's about it for the assignments. And... I took care, I reviewed after the end of the airdrop period. Yesterday during the afternoon, I reviewed the list of students on solar, created files for the students who added during the last 48 to 72 hours. So every student in this class should have their Google Docs file. Save that link, but if you misplace, if you lose that link, just send me an email. And, and I'll send you uh, the link to the file that you are looking for. Of course, when you go to Google Drive, if you open Google Drive in your browser, you can also see what files were shared with you or put CC, CCS325 to, to, to find your file, okay? But no matter if you need any technical assistance with the file, simply let me know. Do you have any questions about the assignments? Any question at all? Okay. Oh, yes. For finding the assignments on your website, there's like no tab for it, right? It just, you just have to scroll? Uh, meaning like, the instructions for the assignment yeah. or, yeah, you go to the week where the assignment, so you go to the, um, lectures and readings page, there there is a reference, a short reference to every uh, assignment. Okay. But otherwise, for example, this is week two. This, no, this is the assignments I have week two open. So the next assignment is posted inside week two. And it says by September 15th, right? And if you go to lectures and readings, when I go to the summary of a week, okay, I see the topics and I see the assignments, right? But it's not from here that I can click. I just have to go back up and click on week two here and then assignments, presentation, readings, there it is, written reflection, and that's where I find the instructions. Okay, so keep in mind you won't have an assignment every week, right? So this is the second assignment, but the third will come later, will not come September 22nd, I believe, okay? But right now, by September 15th, by Friday, the end of the day, you have one more written reflection with an alternative, okay? So. The default for this assignment is the following, and make sure to understand everything because it's a bit more involved. Okay, so first option is old cars, new cars, how do they feel? Feel is the keyword in here. And the idea is you go visit one or more channels of YouTubers who have a lot of followers, and post videos about cars. So you have three options. 
One is Marcus Brownlee's channel autofocus. The second is Nicole Johnson's detour. Not as many videos as in some other channels, but they're all interesting and very well made. The third is from a, a true manic uh, uh, aficionado of cars, Schmi, and he has an extensive collection of cars and testing new cars all the time, and he has a lot of videos. Of course, there is alternatives that you can find as well, right? So if you have another YouTube channel in mind, uh, you can suggest in an email, Professor, can I use, or just Andrea, Andrea, can I use this YouTube channel for my assignment? Because I'm familiar with it. Can I use Jay Leno's channel, etc.? So the idea is to watch at least a couple of videos from any of these channels, preferably, but notice it's just a preference, preferably one video about an older car, another one about a newer car, and focus on passages in the videos where you hear things or see things, including body physical reactions to the experience of driving one of those cars. So the idea is, how do these cars make you feel or are supposed to make one feel? Because we'll be talking a lot about the feeling of driving, the feeling of speed in the literature from the early 1900s. So let's explore this also in a modern context. Your assignment doesn't have to be a comprehensive description summary analysis of these videos. You need two videos exactly because out of those two videos you pick the most interesting moments, right? So if you want to simply introduce the video and say this is a video about this kind of Ferrari, right? And uh, Schmi presents the outside of the car and then the interior and then goes for a drive. That would be the extent of a summary. But then, when you watch the video, you write down things that he says or he does, and how those things that he does or says represent, in a conspicuous way, the feelings produced by driving a car that is, in some way or another, special, right? And what language is being used what is being emphasized by the YouTuber in reference to the experience of driving. So pick just a few examples. As I said, it's not a catalog of the whole video. If the video is 10 minutes, 20 minutes, forget it. Just pick one or two, three passages at the most and talk about. Uh, you can include quotes. You can, if you, if you know how to do it, Take a screenshot, right? And post a screenshot of the uh, uh, silly, crazy face of Schmi driving a Ferrari Roma. Okay, great, right? And then you talk about those faces, you talk about the sounds he makes, etc. That's the idea. It's a reflection, it's not a paper, so it has to be a consistent narrative doesn't necessarily have to have uh, the greatest articulation, okay? The articulation can be simple. Brief introduction of the video, one or two examples from the video that show the powerful reaction of these YouTubers, and if you want to add a comparison between one video and the other, that's fine. If you want to add some personal reactions, that's fine too. For this kind of assignment, you might need more words. I specified the minimum to be 400, 200 per video, up to 600, but again, if you write 650 words, I'm not going to penalize. I'll get angry if you submit an assignment of 2,000 words, right? But 
not if you go above that because you have more to say more to add okay so explore those these channels click on a few videos to get a sense of the characters if you don't know them so that you can pick the most interesting video the the, the one with the best examples okay and you get a sense of that even just by clicking here and there so this is the assignment due Friday of this week but as I said no written assignment next week instead and you find plenty of instructions in here so have a look at those instructions as well the alternative assignment is about the love pack the 1968 film but it's not a traditional film review or film analysis. It's about the automobile in this story, and how the automobile is the catalyst for the love relationship between Jim and Carol. Okay, so the place, the, the, the role played by the car in this relationship, how Jim evolves through his interaction particular peculiar interaction with the car until he becomes mature enough as a man to be able to get married become a full member of society as a married man a husband an accomplished uh, member of society as a winning driver etc keep in mind this is an alternative because we will be talking through the next week about the most popular genre of literature on the automobile from the early 1900s, which is the motor romance. Short stories or novels where a man and a woman fall in love because of the car, because of the circumstances of them driving together or an accident or some way that the car brings them together. Okay? which will be then the recipe for a lot of film even without automobiles right because how will Hollywood the American industry show you how two characters fall in love it's not easy to show that right to justify the fact that these two characters uh, become a couple at least for part of the story and the easiest way to create the, a believable premise to this love relationship is to place these two characters within the same context. Could be an automobile, inside an automobile, right? Very close proximity. And in some of the earliest story, the man is the driver, but sometimes the man is a rich, wealthy gentleman who pretends to be a chauffeur, a driver for hire, exactly because he wants to spend time with this woman a woman from the upper classes or upper middle class in other situations hollywood might have an office environment right man and woman are working together they spend time together of course at the beginning of the film they're opposites complete opposites they hate each other but the more time they spend together and the more they click the more they understand each other right etc in all kinds of situations it could be a trip where the two characters spend time together and fall in love etc etc but it is particularly represented in the love stories with automobiles in the so-called motor romance okay let me know if you need any help with that and week three we have two sets of readings one is required and these are three short stories by Charles Loomis. Initially, they were published inside magazines, journals, in respectively 1900, 1901, 1903. So we're talking about the earliest era of the automobile as a popular product. And later on in 1907, when the car was about to really explode on the consumption market, become a hot commodity, 
a lot of books came out everywhere in the world in 1907 and Loomis caught that trend and so he put together these three short stories and published them in a small book. I have a copy, an original copy of the first edition in 1907, okay? I have prepared some notes and the other reading is optional. It's a PDF that I uploaded that I got from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Gallica is their digital website. And uh, I uploaded copies of this. And it's called L'Automobile Vima. And it's a book for children. It's all about the car as an exotic product. It's also, of course, a reflection of the time so you see the themes of colonialism and you see, of course, racism at work in this document as well. It's in French, I haven't translated it yet, so it's not a required reading. The original was probably from 1897. The fact that in 1897, a book for children was published with the automobile as a, a, an important component makes it at the very least interesting. So you can just go through, look, at the various drawings, etc. And this week's film, it's an incredibly nice film, Bumblebee, uh, one of the best Transformer movies done by a different director, very uh, nice cast and a great story, but it's another story. There is a continuity between the love bug and this one, because this time, Bumblebee, the, uh, the bot, transforms into a yellow Volkswagen Beetle. Okay? Even though normally that bot transforms into a Camaro. Okay? But it's, it's a, another nice story about the relationship between humans and cars and how they change each other. So about this idea of a symbiotic relationship with the technology. So let me go back to <coughs> my notes. I'll try to go through quickly so that we can watch a few more scenes from Herbie. So we have three short stories with a lot of commonalities in terms of how the technology of the automobile is represented. And of course, the three short stories are comedic in nature. They're supposed to be a form of comedy. And they make fun of the automobile as a fashionable item in many ways. Given the fact that they're so early, published in 1900 and 1901, the first two, you can see in their traces of the idea that the new technology is trending, however, it doesn't work. It's not re reliable, it's hard to control, it brings havoc in your life, okay? So, in many ways, it is a traditional man from the 19th century, from before the technology of the automobile, which, who, who gives an ironic, uh, rendering of what the technology can uh, cause in the lives of the protagonists. That's why the main title is The New Technology Between Control and Chaos, where the theme of these three stories is chaos and lack of control, how difficult cars can be to control. There are some emotional reactions that's why I included the word emotionality. But interestingly, there is also some detachment, especially on the part of women, right? Looking at this, looking at men getting crazy about the automobile and remaining kind of cool. Okay, if, if this is your thing, you do you, okay? But uh, this is not exactly for me. And it is also about the relationship between men and women when it comes to the consumption of expensive goods such as 
the automobile. And we'll talk from now on, we'll talk a lot about consumerism. In many ways, the automobile is the first big ticket item of modern consumerism. What is consumerism? Is the idea that you end up as a consumer buying a lot of stuff you don't need. Simply because you feel this strong urge, this desire to get those things, because you are convinced that without these products you are buying, your life will be incomplete, right? I need to have this travel, this bag, this automobile, this computer, this, this portable computer, this, this phone, otherwise my life will not be as it could be. And if I have those items, my life will change. My lifestyle will be such that I'll be a different person. That's the whole premise to consumerism. Not, I need something, what is that can guarantee a reliable performance in reference to the use I'll make for some time. It's instead all about the psyche of the consumer. And keep in mind that during the early 1900s, you, and around the turn of the century between the 19th and the 20th century, you start seeing signs of modern consumerism, the most conspicuous being the idea, and you find that in the newspapers, for example, in England, and a little bit in the US as well, what is one key feature of consumerism? That you, the consumers, including you, 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 and me, you don't necessarily buy things within your price range. You don't always buy things you can afford, right? Sooner or later you buy things you cannot afford. That is typical of consumerism. That is to say, during the Middle Ages, you don't have a peasant buying leather gloves, right? Because they might be able to afford those leather gloves, but they have other priorities. What you find in the period we are exploring is that people start buying one item they can afford in general. Well, they have the money for it, but they'll have to give up on other more vital purchases. But they want to have at least one thing that is out of their social level, right? So uh, people from the middle classes in London will, during this time, buy some expensive clothes that were once reserved to the upper classes. Or accessories, a stick, a belt, gloves, that would normally be purchased by people of a higher social standing or go to an expensive restaurant, and you're all guilty, right? Sooner or later, you all go to a restaurant that you cannot afford, right? And, and pay outrageous prices for a meal, or go to a speakeasy in New York City, uh, to uh, one of these trendy bars, and, and get $25 drinks, or $50 drinks, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't go there. Uh, we all, do that, right? In all Western societies, the so-called new poors, the new poors are people from low-income uh, uh, families who have some items, it could be, for example, their phone, that are much more expensive than what is normally afforded within their level of income. So that is typical, or an item of fashion, right? Pants, shirts, a watch, something. And that is typical of consumerism, and that starts around this period. So I have some notes from previous lectures that I wrote on the board. So let me go through. We've talked about the culture of consumerism. Right, how consumption of certain item, items changes. Capitalism, which was largely based on industrial production in terms of where the money went, 
changes and more and more profits come from the sale of commercial products. Okay? In fact, around this period in the US, you have the equivalent of what would be today Amazon, uh, Alibaba, etc., the mail order catalogs. People from everywhere in the United States, even farther away from Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, receive these catalogs that have hundreds of pages of products they can order and have delivered to their house. All kinds. And what is the profile of the new consumer? As I said, the new consumer is not driven by need alone. And therefore, when somebody talks about the qualities of these products, what's important is not any longer how well you can use that product. You have to, and within the system, you need to emphasize the qualities that will help you sell the product. So, use of the product is not primary concern anymore. The primary concern for the producers is to sell the product. And it seems simple, but it changes a lot, right? You need to sell that product, and then, if the consumer is not satisfied, you just sell them an upgraded version of the product. Does it sound familiar? Right? So, if Google has decided that the Google Watch uh, needs to come out at a certain date, they will come out with that product, even though it's buggy and imperfect. And fix it later. Nobody inside Google said, the watch is not ready. Let's wait. Let's postpone the presentation of the product. It doesn't work that way. Customization becomes a big deal. It's an idea, not a reality. In order to sell the product, I sell you the idea of the product, including that this product is specially made for you. If you buy this product, you, it means that you are a certain kind of consumer who appreciates finer things, who can discriminate between regular, average products and this exceptionally made product, all the way to our phone is 0.5 millimeters thinner and the screen is 13.5% faster, right? Nobody can see that in real life, but that's the game producers and the consumers are entangled in. And I talked about the desire, right? Generating the desire to buy. Meaning, it's not like you, the consumers, want a product. No, no, no. I, the producer, or better yet, I, the marketer of a producer, I have to convince you, I have to show you that you didn't know, but you want this product. Let me, let me help you understand how much you want this product. And let me guide you through the process of your realization that you cannot live without this product. And so from desire, you get to urge, right? To this idea, I need it now. I cannot wait until Christmas. I need it now. I need this product now. And the modern, the best modern examples would be the people who used to, now it doesn't happen as much, but the people who five years ago, 10 years ago, would camp outside an Apple store for 10 days in a tent to be the first to get the model as soon as it came out. As I said before, the focus, the emphasis shifts from the use of the product to the purchase of a product, and you see that in the literature. For the first time, you find books or short stories where not only they talk to you about a product and its use, but they talk to you about the process of choosing this and how they purchase the product. So that the consumerist experience becomes part of the literature on the product itself. In these short, short stories, you find three couples in each story. 
by Charles Loomis you find a cap. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention just briefly, as I said, Charles Loomis was a writer and a journalist. He was born in Brooklyn, uh, New York in 1861, I believe. He died in 1911 of cancer. And he was one of those journalists that in the mature period of his career, when he became successful, he would write especially short stories about social trends, social customs, uh, social types. And once in a while, every two years or so, he would collect the best of his production in a book. So he was selling his short stories to the magazines and also then selling books to the readers. In each of these three stories, you find a couple. In the first one, a woman by the name of Araminta, and that's the title of the story, interestingly, and her husband, whose name is not mentioned in the story. In the second story, you find Martha and John, and Araminta and her husband are upper middle class. They can barely afford a car, but they do. Martha and John are more affluent, upper class. And then you find a younger couple who will get engaged and then marry at the end of the story, Annette and Orville. Annette and Orville meet in New York. Martha and John and Araminta and her husband live in suburban uh, areas around New York City. And uh, if you want, I can summarize briefly these stories, but that's a required reading, right? So Araminta's husband is a commuter, lives in the suburbs, goes to work on a train to the big city. And he doesn't like the train. He doesn't like talking to people. Um, and uh, he decides, and also wants to be fashionable, right? So he decides to purchase an automobile. And you find the story of the purchase, one of the steps in the purchase. During this period, you would buy a car. But when you bought a car, normally, if this was your first car, you didn't know how to drive. And you didn't need a license initially. So what happened was that the dealer, dealerships were called agencies. A representative from the agency would deliver the car to your house. And this staff from the agency would stay with you to teach you how to drive. So they would stay with you for at least a couple of hours to do two things. One, show you how to drive the car. Two, sometimes also show you how to make simple repairs. Because as I said, these cars broke down a lot. So you, need, you needed to know how to change a belt or adjust the timing, etc. So this guy comes from the agency to deliver the car. And Araminta's husband sends him away. Because, of course, he's a member of the upper echelon of society. So somebody who works in an agency, this, this lowly human, cannot be teaching him anything. right? He claims he knows everything, sends the guy away, and then tells her wife, we'll go out with the car. He starts driving, and he crashes around his house. Crashes a veranda, crashes a barn. The wife gets on board. They go out on this rural road. And of course, they crash into everything. They crash into a carriage with their doctor. And the doctor is thrown off the carriage onto the automobile itself. And of course, they'll have to change doctors at the end. So the entire story is about this man's inability to control the car and how cars are so fussy that the claim is that your life is better with a car. In fact, the opposite is true. That's the summary, short summary of the story. Martha and John is a very elaborate story, but then I'll show you how grounded in reality this is. So John would love to get an automobile. However, his wife wouldn't want that, and she's very much 
one of those more traditional types who loves horses. So keep in mind this dynamic. Consumerism also means can a man or a woman purchase an expensive item such as a car without consulting the other, without the other's permission, right? Of course, these are upper classes families or middle upper classes couples. So women enjoy more power, more freedom, right? That's why they have to be part of the decision. But within the culture of consumerism, the intention is to break down the families and the couples. Because if couples make purchases together, then you have one family unit, one purchase. But if you break them, then you have a couple and two consumers. That's ideally what you want. So John would love to get an automobile, but he knows that Martha would not be happy. However, Martha loves horses a lot. It just so happens that Martha one day gets some poison oak in her eyes, and the doctor says, you have to rest your eyes, put this cream, and put these smoke lenses on your eyes so that the light will not irritate your eyes. So she's virtually blind, almost blind. John comes up with this brilliant plan. He goes to the city, purchases a car, then goes to a place in the city selling saddles and other accessories for horse riding. And they have, outside of the store, they have this wooden horse. He purchases the horse and has the car modified so that they attach the wooden horse in front of the car. He even purchases a phonograph with the sound of horses' hooves. So everything is ready. His plan is to tell Martha that he purchased for her a new carriage to take her out on this tricked out automobile and at the end of the ride to tell her this was not a horse and carriage, this was a new car, how did you like the ride? And if she said, I loved it, then it would be a done deal. He could keep the car, okay? So he does so. She's unsuspecting, she's happy. She says, oh, okay, I, I can see this is a nice carriage. And I'll show you pictures. There are pictures in this presentation of all kinds of automobiles during this period that looked like a carriage. Essentially, were modified carriages with an engine. So they go out and she says, oh, this is such a smooth ride. And this horse has such a regular uh, trot, right? Because the sound is still the same. By the end of the story, things start to go wrong. Once again, like in Araminta's and her husband's story, the man who's driving the carriage, the man from the agency is driving the carriage, the, this automobile with a fake horse in, in, in front, cannot control the car, they have an accident. Martha is thrown off the carriage. And so John tells the guy from the agency, okay, no deal. Bring the car back to the city. Uh, I cannot keep it because my wife will be mad at me because I almost killed her. By the end of the story, though, she says, no, it's okay. We should keep the car. Uh, we'll be fine. And so... John calls back the men from the agency and they decide to keep a car, so they evolve. They transform into a modern couple whose, life, whose lives revolve also around the automobile. Third story, Annette is a new woman. New woman is a label around this time that we'll find in other books that means a feminist. The new woman was the lingo used to talk about proto-feminists of the period, stronger, more independent women. How is she so? Well, Annette comes from the Midwest. And that's important because around this time, women from the Northeast, allegedly, supposedly, were following the models of the French or British bourgeoisie. 
they were trying to be ladylikes in the upper classes or middle upper classes. And instead, a true and true American woman from the Midwest, from mid-America, is someone who is more courageous, more active, more dynamic, maybe less refined, but with a different kind of spirit, not playing the part of the submissive wife. Right. And Annette is single. She's visiting a relative in New York. And Orville is single as well. Successful, he's a successful writer of a self-help book. So he's a modern kind of writer, writing about self-improvement, philosophy and self-improvement. So Orville thinks Annette could become her fian his fiance. And then Orville, we're uh, around Christmas, receives the news that Annette right after Christmas will leave New York to go to Paris to visit another relative who's there. And so he says, either I make my move now or it's done. Annette is nice, young, beautiful. She'll find someone in France who will pursue her, right? So either I act before she leaves or uh, nothing will happen between us. So Orville goes to buy a ring in New York and goes back to his bachelor's apartment where he lives with a butler. He has an assistant, right? Which later you will find in plenty of movies even in the 1940s and 50s. When he's going back to the apartment, he slips on the sidewalk and hurts his foot and ankle. So there he is, just a couple of hours from the dinner where he has to at the end of the dinner, talk to Annette and propose to her. And he cannot even walk. He cannot even put a shoe. So he has <laughs> an elegant shoe on one foot and a slipper with flowers on the other because, of course, the foot is swollen. So he says, OK, I'll go anyway, because otherwise nothing will happen. But I will call a taxi cab. He calls an electric taxi, right, which were very popular in New York around the late 1890s, early 1900s. There were hundreds of these electric cabs. And you'll see it. It's a very peculiar kind of cab with the driver sitting up high in the back and the passenger in front. And he tells the driver where he's going, right, to Upper West Side, Upper East Side, something like that. When they reach their destination, the car won't stop. So Orville says, what's going on? The driver says, the car won't stop. Don't worry, though. We'll circle around block until we run out of charge. It's an electric car, so it's bound to stop at some time. And Orville says, yes, he cannot jump off the car because he has one bad foot, but he's worried. Because time is passing, and in fact, we see another scene in the. We read about another scene in the book, in the story. Annette is at the table; they're talking, and in fact, there is another character who's talking a lot about the ills of technology and the thousand ways you can die with modern technologies. In an elevator, uh, hit by a car, on a steamship, etc. So Orville is worried, he starts shouting every time he goes by this, this house where Annette is having dinner with the other guests. He tries to get himself hurt. Finally, they hear him. So they all come down to see him come by. And first, this guy who was talking about the ills of technology, Joe, I think is his name, jumps on the car and brings poor Orville some food. Orville says, I don't need you, I don't need food, I need Annette. So see if you can get Annette on the car, because that way I can propose. Annette being a new woman from mid-America, jumps on the car. And right before the car comes to a stop, running out of battery, Orville proposes 
And of course, Annette says yes. They'll wait for Orville's foot to heal, and then they'll both go to Paris for their honeymoon. Okay, so that's the story. What's interesting about this in terms of control, right? In the first story, the husband doesn't have any control of the car. John loses control of the car, driven by someone else. Orville is sequestered inside the automobile. So he's hostage to the technology, which is one of the tropes in this kind of literature. Keep that in mind. And what's interesting, I won't, for, I won't elaborate on this now, is that in a lot of narratives about technologies, you see different stages before the technology enters your life, during the experience of the technology, and after the aftermath of the use of the technology, which can be positive or negative. And this becomes the basis then for tech evangelism, etc. So, nothing that I should add here. You can review these notes. I'll just show you the illustrations, right? This is an example of a prototype that was patented, although we don't know whether it was ever made. This is a carriage with an engine with a fake horse's hat. Somebody really thought about it, and their reasoning was psychological, meaning what makes people scared of automobiles? Why can't we sell as many automobiles as we could at the moment? Well, because people are used to driving a carriage, looking at the back of the head of a horse. So if we do the same setup, reproduce the same setup for a car, they'll be relaxing, right? They won't worry as much. And this will help us sell cars. Yes, Madison. Would that be considered like one of the world's first car mods? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure there must have been other examples because people had, were very creative about vehicles, especially at the beginning. But it's certainly one of the weirdest car mods, right? And it was patented, right? The patent was sent to Washington. And you find links if you want to know more about this. And I reproduced some ex uh, excerpts in here. You have Uriah Smith is the inventor of this. And he called this the horsey horseless. And if you look, there is an illustration on Wikipedia of how this could be made. Okay. And again, you can read this. Joe Barton is the guy who said. And this is the illustration. This is not the book, this is the magazine. This is the illustration. This is the taxi that we're talking about. And why this shape? Because it is the same shape of a kind of very popular carriage or cab, very popular in London as well as the US, called the Hansel Cab, with the driver on top, in the back. Sometimes you see these reproduced as props in movies about Jack the Ripper or 19th century, late 19th century England, right? Normally there would be a horse pulling this, and the passenger is here enjoying their privacy. Although there is a tube to communicate, so you can communicate, you can talk to the driver, and the driver will respond to you. And look, they put a cupid angel here in the back to show that the car is the instrument of love, that the car is the catalyst for this relationship. And Notice also the representation of the driver looks very much like the driver of a horse and carriage. Look at the attitude. Because if you drive a carriage with a horse, and you're familiar with the horse, right? It's like a pet, you establish a connection. The horse itself can drive, doesn't need you. If you're driving a familiar path, the horse will take care of everything. That's why traditional drivers, coachmen, would be like this, half asleep, like barely paying attention if they were driving along the same route. And this is the attitude here. Of course, if you drive a car, you cannot 
slouch that much or relax that much. And this is one of the scenes, brats in New York City throwing rocks at this car that won't stop. Here you have Orville and the driver. Notice they have lanterns, of course, right? With, with gas inside or oil. And this is Joe Barton jumping with some food, jumping first on this car. Because of course, the car itself is an electric car, probably was driving around at 10, 15 miles per hour. That was the average speed of an electric taxi cab. Not impossible to escape from if you have two good feet. And this is Annette and Orville. However, the illustrator didn't understand the profile of the character. So Annette here is very shy, very old style, but it's not in the short story. She's more forceful, more decisive. She knows what is going on. And look, these are actual pictures, right? This, let, let me make this full screen so you can appreciate this better. See? Look how strange this contraption is. Electric, right? Driver in the back, the seat itself is pure carriage technology. And there is a door in front, actually opens like that, two half doors. And this is where you step on or off, right? And you sit there comfortably. If it is cold, since this is open, they give you a blanket to put on your legs, right? So these things, are the things described in these short stories. This is another example. It's not the same kind of carriage, but it's interesting because, first of all, it does look like a carriage, not an automobile. And a lot of these were produced. But look, more importantly, it's another example of this weird choice whereby the driver sits in the back so that they don't disturb the passengers. Because if they sit in front, then the view of the passengers is obstructed. Passengers want to go for a ride to see outside and be seen by other people outside, right? You go out in the boulevards of Paris or the avenues of, of New York at 10 miles per hour and people wave at you. People say, well, look, this is Mr. Mrs. and Mr. Rockefeller or Vanderbilt, okay? And again, you have this engine in the back. Another example of an automobile that looks like a carriage with a driver in the back. The others had just the lever, this one has a wheel. This is exactly the picture of the taxi from the story of Loomis, right? Exactly that, up to the wheels. And you can read more, these links are just for your curiosity. But go through the presentation, look at the here you see a rich couple, but this time you have a driver and an assistant in front instead of in the back. 